Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Li Jia Xu and uh, I'm the research director for the Google Citizen Smart Cities. Uh, I'm also managing the Scalable Computation Intelligence Group at TAC. So the Google System is a UT grant challenge and with, with mission to developing human AI partnership that can benefit society. So this year, Google System has this uh, uh, vision to have a smart city research focus area uh, to advance our knowledge and research around smart cities. And we developing this consortium to welcome researchers, city officials, and other interested uh, peoples who in the smart city technologies uh, areas. And we meet twice a month and for a 50 minutes informal a talk and the presentations, uh, followed by some questions and the discussions. So for today, for today, we are very happy to have uh, uh, our um, Dr. Yu Yu Fan to join us. Uh, Dr. Fan is a professor in the civic and the Invo environment uh, environmental engineering at UC Davis. She is currently serving as a program director for the civic infra infrastructure system program at the National Science Foundation. Her research is on transportation and energy infrastructure systems modeling and analysis with, speci with a special interest in integrated applied mathematics and engineering domain knowledge to address challenges through brought by system uncertainties, dynamics, and the indeterminacy issues. Uh, so I will turn the uh, floor to Dr. Ma, uh, Dr. Fan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to share my recent work uh, with a, a, a broader audience uh, that's beyond the civil engineers who I talk most frequently. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, today, I would like to share with you a recent project uh, that we did for understanding error estimation for networked data. Uh, what we did in the project uh, was specifically for sensor data, mainly loop detector data uh, on freeways. But I hope the audience could actually broaden their, you know, just imagination. Any data that's a connect uh, collected. Uh, from a network that has kind of a network structure underlying uh, can actually benefit from what we, uh, this kind of met methodology where we try to take advantage of the uh, spatial or temporal correlations of the data. So the specific problem statement is how to identify systematic measurement errors uh, in, sensor, in sensor data collected over a traffic network. And so here sensor, we mean in a very generic term, uh, it could be actually physical sensors or could be data collected by human being. Those data could actually come with two kinds of uh, error types. It comes with random error and it could uh, could also come with a systematic error. And that with the random errors, one could actually kind of cope with it by re you know, repetitive measurements. And so you hope that uh, that will alleviate random error. But with a systematic error, just simply increasing the sample, uh, the number of samples, it will, it, it's not going away. And so that's the type of errors that we are going to focus on in this project. Uh, and with the data becoming more and more important in supporting all levels of transportation system decisions, we think this is a critical step. And this is actually, this was a side project that uh, when we were trying to integrate data from various sensors, uh, on a traffic network, try to understand the demand, we noticed that um, many sensors are either malfunctioning or have significant data error involved. And so we came up with a way of addressing those bias in the data. And so when we started the project, we noticed that uh, there was a rich uh, literature on uh, sensor health monitoring, but uh, almost all the work focused on identifying bad sensors. Uh, you know, in terms, basically, the question is, 
uh, which sensors are bad to be discarded. And the approach is uh, pretty much uh, relied on analyze, comparing the sensor uh, readings with the historical data and then see if the pattern, uh, it, if the readings uh, deviate too much from the usual pattern or comparison between neighboring sensors. And there was a recent uh, project that took advantage of a network topology uh, where the, all the sensors on a traffic net network uh, were studied all together. Uh, and but then again, the question was which subsets uh, of sensors should be discarded based, you know, uh, based on some uh, linear algebra analysis. And so in our work, we uh, specifically uh, was we were interested in how bad sensors are, and then uh, are those sense can those sensors data uh, can those sensor data can uh, be corrected, and then. Uh, we look at both the hard data directly collected from the field and then combined with the domain knowledge with our understanding of the network of physics and operation. And for example, if we understand how the flow works in a network, uh, here is an extremely simple example where you have you know, three links connected together. And then we understand that given enough time to clear out all the flow in, in this uh, small network, uh, the total inflow uh, should equal to the total outflow. So we could actually express this relation V1 equals V2 plus V3. And then if the data uh, are collected correctly, this relationship should hold. But with the error, we may not have this relationship. And so this page is a summary of our research method design. So basically we first express each sensor data in terms of its true value and the measurement. Uh, so V is the actual measured count equals Z is the true, count, uh, true value of the traffic volume and plus some kind of errors. And then we rearrange this uh, term to express error in terms of a systematic error and a random error. So this is what you see here. Uh, and then once we have that, we can express that uh, the expected value of your measurement is actually you know, true value Z plus some kind of a ratio. So we call this new uh, systematic error ratio multiply by Z. So the systematic error is a proportional to the true value. Uh, and then we introduce uh, the spatial relation here. So the total inflow equals the total outflow. Uh, this is just, this is a uh, more generic uh, way of expressing the equation that you saw earlier using the very simple three-link network. And then through uh, just plugging this, uh, this equation to the uh, spatial relation, uh, we can then express, this is a bit uh, kind of a rearrangement with this introducing some uh, uh, additional term so that can uh, make the equation, the set of a linear system of equation more compact. But basically it's just a rearrangement of the uh, spatial relation that you see here. So with that, we have a set of equations that we want to, uh, to, to hold. And then we recognize that all the measures that we receive, that V, uh, they themselves should be random. So it, it wouldn't make sense to say the left-hand side equals the right-hand side of the equation, but rather we will require this equation to hold in a statistical manner. So basically the moments, the first moment, or you can go up to case moment uh, should equal for the left side, uh, hand side and the uh, right hand side of the equations. And so we adopt a uh, kind of a general moment matching uh, approaches. 
Uh, and there, there were some technical challenges that we had to address. Uh, first one is to make sure that we choose the dispersion matrix uh, in the general, generalized uh, moment matching method uh, to make sure that uh, the efficiency is achieved, right? So uh, as, as we, uh, the, uh, the, the as we collect different uh, multiple samples and so on, our estimation is most efficient. So this is the first uh, uh, aspect that we had to address. And then second is that we want to make sure uh, whether the system has a unique solution for the estimation problem. Um, this relates to observability identifiability issue because in some set of a linear equation uh, it, linear system you may not uh, be able to achieve a unique solution so we try to understand first whether a system has a unique solution and then how to increase additional information to ensure uh, identifiability and then third issue is if the sensor is incomplete, you don't have sensors everywhere. And then uh, the, on some network links, you don't have any readings. And how do we automa automatically reconstruct the sensor network so that uh, this analysis uh, has a meaningful input data? Uh, so I, I'm uh, skipping those technical details uh, and then just directly jump to some examples. Uh, the first example that we are looking at is a relatively small uh, network. And then we manu uh, kind of uh, uh, fabricated the sensor readings. And then so we pretend that we know the true uh, sensor uh, systematic errors for all the uh, link volumes. Uh, so you, you see different colors of the links uh, correspond to different level of uh, error uh, bias, basically. And then uh, we generate these uh, readings accordingly. And then we pretend, not, then we go with, uh, uh, pretend that we don't know the true uh, bias, and then we uh, estimate the sensor errors. And then, uh, so on the figure uh, here, the first figure here, uh, what you see is the, uh, the uh, this is absolute error. So uh, comparison between the estimated value and the uh, uh, true value. And you see this uh, deviation, the difference is rather small. And uh, we kind of uh, uh, changed the relative random error. So we varied relative random error and then just uh, you know, see how sensitive our results or methods are, are to those random error. Uh, and then turns out that, uh, yeah, a random error does have a slight impact, but overall the estimation quality is good. And then, uh, in the figure uh, on the upper right, we start with uh, looked at the sensitivity of our estimation quality against the number of calibrated sensors in the network. And so we uh, identified that with very small number, like one or two, calibrated sensors, so th those sensors have uh, actually measurements being uh, true, uh, close, very close to its true value, the estimation quality uh, can remain very good, right? So increasing more calibrated sensors actually does not bring uh, much uh, improvement. And then uh, in the figure here at the bottom, uh, we actually did some testing because in our met method, we designed that uh, the sensor by uh, the systematic bias is a constant number. And then, so we were curious, what if the true sensor uh, uh, bias is actually a uh, kind of a, has some kind of a, a stochastic nature. And so we actually varied the true sensor 
bias and then did a test. And then turns out the relative estimation error is still uh, rather small. So what you see, th this uh, violin plot is an entire distribution uh, of the difference between the, the relative difference between uh, the true sensor bias and the estimated sensor bias. Uh, the second network that uh, we tested on is a, a real world network from Orange County in Southern California. And the, this network is a considered a, a medium to large size for network analysis uh, with you know, close to 700 links uh, and uh, some are uh, Interfreeway ramps and then some are on ramps and then off ramps. And uh, here is a uh, report on the estimation quality. So the first figure on the left uh, plots the true estimation versus the estimated, uh, oh, the, the true value, true bias, and then the estimated bias. And then uh, you can see that they align along the diagonal and uh, pink, pink color uh, shows the 95% range. So most of the, uh, the, the outliers are plotted in blue. Uh, and you can see the estimation is actually uh, reason, reasonably good. With uh, you know, the bias, when it's larger, the uh, kind of uh, variance is larger. And then the net uh, on the plot to your right, uh, the green dots show the actually observed data, uh, and the blue uh, dots show the estimated flow. So this is the actual flow uh, versus the, the, the observed flow versus the estimated flow, and then uh, you can also see the true flow, and uh, so. Uh, this is actually another way of looking, checking against the uh, estimation quality in terms of a flow, not uh, the, the bias itself. Uh, so with those encouraging results, we are quite confident that this work can be extended and then can uh, to the real world applications. And we are now trying to automate the entire process and make it to a open source package uh, for practitioners to use. Um, and so that's the exciting part. And I, uh, let me just summarize the main contributions of this work. Uh, you know, we tried through this work, we improved understanding about the sensor errors uh, estimation process in a networked context. And so why we are so interested in network context, because most of the data related to infrastructure system, not, not limited to transportation, uh, have network underlying network structure. So if uh, one can, take advantage of those kind of uh, spatial correlation built in in the, in the network the data, then uh, that should actually add more information to uh, the estimation process. Uh, and uh, we also established some theoretical uh, results uh, of finite sample and large sample properties uh, from statistics uh, perspective uh, uh, perspective, uh, which I did not report uh, in today's talk. Uh, and then we are excited about this very flexible modeling framework. So basically, uh, they, if, if you have some analytical understanding uh, of the domain, uh, it, whether it's operation or whether it's just a topology relation, that can be translated to analytical models, uh, then that model can be plugged in to this uh, estimation framework. And so that uh, leads to some new opportunities to 
incorporate domain knowledge, domain expertise. I presented this work uh, at UC Irvine and uh, some colleagues from water, uh, water uh, quality uh, control uh, approached me after the seminar and uh, was wondering the water uh, samples that they collected from various uh, locations in a water distribution pipeline, uh, would that be some applications uh, that could you know, uh, benefit from this ways of thinking? And so th those are interesting uh, future extensions. Uh, I, I look forward to, uh, to working with colleagues from different uh, CIS uh, domains. Uh, and then uh, just uh, share very quickly, this, this was a, uh, a kind of a small uh, product from a class that I taught for undergraduate students. And so we used this data set for teaching and the students were you know, very interested. So my TAs helped to create a interface where of course it would be too much to expect undergraduate students. Uh, th these are actually um, mostly from sophomore years students. Uh, it would be too much to uh, expect that students understand every de technical details. So we kind of automated the process and then the students could actually play with a small data set and then uh, change uh, this bar and just express that the, the, the threshold that they want to uh, set for uh, identifying sensor uh, health. And then the, the, the this, uh, uh, the tool will then highlight uh, those suspicious sensors uh, within the study area. And so that's a way of integrating data analysis and uh, uh, with, uh, with the civil engineering uh, teaching. I would like to acknowledge funding support from NSF. And then most of the work was done by my graduate student, former students and one of current students uh, who contributed most you know, uh, uh, greatly to, the, uh, to the, the results of this project that I just shared. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. It's very interesting. So I definitely can relate to the um, the other person you mentioned, like uh, the what from the water resource. Part of the uh, thing we highlight from the winter storm is so uh, there's a lot of water pipe burst, but the Austin water doesn't actually have a good way to easily identify where they have a prop the broken pipes within their water delivery system. So maybe some more of those kind of analytic can actually help them by read the last reading and have that determinations. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Hi, Junfeng. Yeah. I, I have a question, Dr. Uh, uh, Yuya. This is a very interesting talk. We can see many applications with what we're doing at the UT. I just uh, mentioned some examples. If I understand, if I understand it correctly, this is a fixed sensors. And there, there's also a sensor based on existing infrastructure. For example, as you know, we can use a car as a carrier for sensors to when car move within the city, it's also collect information automatically. Uh, related to that, a Google car actually collect the air pollution information within cities. Uh, one of my student, uh, Tony, also on the talk is uh, uh, doing some research on like uh, uh, Google car air pollution uh, sensor. Uh, so I can, maybe you can give us some suggestion how do we uh, use your method to this uh, mobile <laughs> mobile sensor detection. Uh, and uh, that's my first question. My second question is, uh, sorry, uh, we are doing like, a, we collaborate with uh, robotics. We are develop a, uh, uh, like a last mile delivery option using uh, automatic robotic system. We, we realized that uh, again, this uh, system can automatically collect the environment information when it delivers. So we were thinking maybe again, so you may can give us some uh, uh, some suggestion on how to incorporate this uh, two function to one uh, platform. Yeah, uh, 
currently uh, we are extending. So you notice that the the relation, the physical uh, relationship that we incorporated is basically on aggregated flow in this yeah. talk, right? It's a very simple, uh, static kind of uh, relationship. And then uh, we are currently working on dynamic systems. So we have a system of ODE uh, where the traffic dynamics are captured. And we, uh, so that the, the kind of information we incorporate are much more fine and with the fine resolution and much more detailed. Uh, and there, those mobile sensor data will actually be very helpful. Uh, you, so, so you could actually have a trajectory data, right? And then uh, you could also have a density data, you could have a speed acceleration and so on and to build into those dy dynamic traffic model. Uh, we should have, we're making very good progress. We should have uh, uh, updated uh, uh, results either through uh, conference papers or publication that will probably take a while. Uh, but uh, we'll be very happy to share new results uh, with you. Uh, the, in terms of uh, environmental data and so on, I, I think analytical model expressing air quality re relation uh, can be very complicated. I've seen uh, you know, air quality model and that uh, captures air dynamics, right? And some of this model may not be analytical. So if it's a simulation based, uh, it might be a little bit more uh, challenging to directly plug into the, the method that I propose. Uh, in that case, you may not want to, uh, you know, I have some vague idea, but uh, you know, it's just it, you cannot directly borrow it because you know the methods that we build uh, is actually for analytical expression. But there are other ways, uh, and it's interesting. I talked with a friend who was uh, working on uh, genes, so they do gene testing and so on. And then uh, you know, he told me there are also network structures in genes. And then so he was interested in using uh, kind of a, not necessarily exactly the same method, but he was inspired that instead of uh, uh, just looking at each measurement, uh, he's actually looking at all the measurements collected from uh, the, the entire gene, genome network to identify sent uh, measurement errors. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. So yeah, the, the underlying uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the idea, the key idea is to utilize our domain knowledge. So whichever domain knowledge that, that you acquire from your experience working with this kind of a data set should actually be uh, exploited so that we don't just rely on purely data-driven methodology. <laughs> this can be applied to social network as well as there in the, uh, many, many different domains, as, as you said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> So, so can this model be used to detect, say, multiple simultaneously failures in this network? Uh, so that will actually, depending on how you define failures, I imagine uh, if the failure is just a close down of a link, it would probably be easier. But uh, if it's extreme, a condition that affected the, the capacity, but the flow is still going on, that might be difficult to identify because you would not know whether this is the, the, the huge, you know, the shock waves, the congestion are due to a spike of a demand or whether it's due to sudden disruption on the supply side. I see. Yeah. yeah, that's um, yeah, that's definitely makes sense. Um, I was more thinking of the problem that is a uh, have a significantly, let's say, lower 
uh, flow or, or lower uh, values in the link not uh, complete a shutdown. So this um, um, could happen with a, a meta a metabolic network and where when you have a disease and the, your uh, metabolic net, uh, inter interaction network changes. Um, yeah, I have to think about that uh, because here we are basically treating error, which is, it's not a completely no reading. Uh, if it's no reading that we just discarded, it can be, a, can be through pre-process, we can identify these kind of uh, sensors would actually just be uh, a malfunction uh, and then discard it. But we are treating the data that has a systematic bias, which can be corrected, right? And so in the system where you have a major failure, the dynamics may work very differently. So I, I want to be a bit more careful. Uh, I, I don't have an immediate answer for you, but that's an interesting direction to think about. So, so Dr. Yu, can I say, if I understand correctly, this model work best when the system is stable, if uh, there's some uh, eruption or disruption to the system, like a major uh, earthquake or disaster event, then it's basically not that applicable to, the, to that kind of situation. Yeah, my uh, immediate uh, thought is it's, it's probably true because we rely on the systems of equations that could capture the physics, right? And then uh, under major or sudden disruption, uh, if you have some ways of capturing the system dyna dynamics, then you would be able to build your estimation model on it. But if your expression about the, the, the system, how the system will evolve uh, under disruption itself is not a correct. So the model specification has error. Then I would be very worried, right? Because you know you you build the entire estimation framework on uh, based on your uh, domain knowledge. That piece, that domain knowledge piece, should be at least uh, uh, close to the reality. Close to reality. Yeah, <laughs> that totally makes sense. Yeah. So those like there's no more other questions. So I want to thank Dr. Fang again for this wonderful talk and the interesting work. Um, we um, uh, we're, uh, we're, I think our next meeting will be in the March 30th and uh, we have another interesting talk. Um, so everyone welcome to uh, sign up our mailing list and uh, follow our website and for more information. And uh, thank you very much for your attending today. Um, probably see you in the next events. Thanks. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Fan, for a wonderful 